G'day and welcome to my Adventure Kings Solar Masterclass video series. Now in this series, I'm gonna cover a lot of topics, including how solar panels actually work, the different types of common solar cells, how solar panels are actually tested and rated to get their output watts, plus I'll talk about what factors affect solar panel output in the real world. That'll lead into how to choose the right solar panels and how much solar you'll need for your setup. Finally, we'll finish up with some FAQs and troubleshooting. Now, in this first video, we're gonna to touch on how solar actually works and the different types of common solar cells. That'll give you a really good understanding for the rest of the series. Now, to understand how solar works, you're gonna need a little bit of understanding about electricity and circuits in general. So let's take a look at this diagram. Solar panels consist of two main layers of silicon, which are typically seen as the dark blue or black surface of the panel. These layers are treated with different elements like boron and phosphorus to create different electrical charges, positive and negative. One layer has phosphorus added, becoming rich in electrons and giving it a negative charge. The other layer has boron added, which creates an excess of holes, which are gaps where electrons could be, essentially giving it a positive charge. In most solar panels, the top layer holds the excess electrons and the bottom layer has the excess holes. This is characteristic of a P-type solar panel. N-type panels, on the other hand, have the layers reversed so that the top layer has an excess of holes and the bottom layer has an excess of electrons. N-type solar is slightly more efficient, but it also costs more to produce, so overall, it's a little more expensive. When sunlight hits the panel, Photons, which are particles of light, knock electrons free from the N-type layer. These freed electrons try to move towards the P-type layer where the holes are. However, they can't pass directly through that P to N junction because of an electrical field that exists there. This electrical field acts as a barrier. Instead of returning directly to the holes, the electrons travel through the silicon layer, getting captured by thin conductive wires called fingers, and then through bus bars, which are the thicker wires you can see on a solar panel. Each individual solar cell only produces a small amount of voltage and current when light hits it, which is why you'll see many cells together to form the panel itself. Next up, we need to talk about the actual construction of the cell because there are three main consumer grade solar types, monocrystalline, polycrystalline and amorphous or thin film solar. They all have their pros and cons, so let's start with thin film solar. Amorphous cells are slightly better in low light and cloudy conditions. They're thinner and more flexible, but that comes at a massive cost as they're much more expensive to produce and buy, and they're much less efficient for surface area. You'd need about two to three times the surface area with an amorphous or thin film solar cell to get the same output as a mono or polycrystalline cell. The absolute top shelf amorphous cells are about 10% efficient. That means they can convert about 10% of the sunlight that hits them into usable energy. Or put another way, if you had a one meter square amorphous thin film solar cell and 1000 watts of light was hitting it, it would only output about 100 watts. That's 10% of 1000. Next up, we've got polycrystalline solar, which is the cheapest to produce and therefore the cheapest for consumers to buy. It's actually made by pouring molten silicon into a mold. But what that means is as the cell cools at different rates, you're gonna end up with cracks, joints, and fractures that lead to inefficiencies. Overall, they're about 22% efficient. So again, if you had a one meter square solar panel with 1000 watts of light hitting it, you'd get about 220 watts of output. Finally, we've got monocrystalline solar panels, which are the most efficient for their size in this consumer grade, before you get into things like perk cells or bifacial cells. Now, instead of using molten silicon, they're actually made from a single thin sliver of silicon, which means there's no joints, cracks, or fractures. That leads to higher efficiency. It also performs a little bit better than poly in warm conditions, or low light conditions. Overall, they can be about 26% efficient. So again, a one meter square panel with 1000 watts of light hitting it would output around 260 watts. 
Now, all those percentage efficiencies would typically be found in a lab setting in ideal conditions, not in the real world, but it's a good place to start. And just a note here, all Adventure King solar panels are monocrystalline. The next thing to look at is the amount of bus bars on the cell. Now, as I mentioned earlier, bus bars are the thicker silver lines on the solar panel that carry the current through your entire circuit. So the more of these you have, the more that the current is being shared. That leads to higher efficiencies and less voltage drop. Modern solar cells will have multiple bus bars, maybe five or even 10, which helps prevent loss of output if one of the bus bars is damaged or fractured during use. Old panels might only have two or three. So if you lose one of those to damage, the other two are now sharing a lot more current, leading to more voltage drop and less efficiency. So if you've got an older panel and you think it's not performing as well as it could, maybe it's time to upgrade. There are some exceptions to the rule when it comes to bus bars though. One notable example is that bus bars are on top of the cell. So therefore when the light's hitting the cell, the bus bar is actually slightly shading the cells underneath. To counter this, some manufacturers use what are called shingle cells. Similar to the tiles on a shingle roof, these actually have the bus bars on the very end of the cell, at the top end, and underneath at the bottom end, which means when you stack them like a tiled or shingled roof, the bus bars are connected, but there's no shading on top of the panel, and that's gonna slightly increase efficiency. Once you put all this information together, you can start to get a picture of how much power a solar panel of a certain size should be outputting. If it's a mono panel, it'll put out slightly more than a poly panel of the same size. And if it has slightly more efficient cells, it'll put out slightly more power than one with less efficient cells. However, if you see a small panel advertised with hundreds of watts more than similar size panels, the seller is probably telling you stories. So in the next episode, we're actually gonna take this 100 watt solar panel and put it into a solar simulator and tester. That'll show us how it's actually tested and rated to get that 100 watt figure.